ready for an awesome adventure? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to have an incredible adventure together. We're going to explore some of the coolest places on Earth. But most importantly, we're going to explore you, why you're awesome. And I want to share it with you in the most fun way I can, and that's by using some examples from my super ludicrous sport of adventure racing. They have traveled here from every corner of the world. For 10 non-stop days and nights, they must hike, mountain climb, paddle, ride, and race through some of the most captivating yet dangerous terrain in one of the last great wilderness areas on Earth. Now, before you think this is another crazy sports analogy, tell me if this doesn't describe your real life, if you didn't know I was describing a sport. All right, so I have small teams of men and women, and we're trying to make it through a seemingly endless series of checkpoints in pursuit of a nearly impossible goal, working against extreme time pressures and constantly changing market conditions with the goal of doing it better than anybody else in the industry. Well, yes, welcome to, my, <laughs> welcome to my world. The higher you get on any mountain, what happens to the terrain? It gets steeper, right? So your ability to continue to get to the next highest peak is not just a matter of you trying harder as an individual. It's not just a matter of reaching up. It's a matter of reaching out to the people around you and creating what I call true human synergy. On the ridge to Eton Peak, the lead teams are learning that things are not always as they seem. There's a fake, false summit. It'll be soul destroying when they get there and realize they've only gone a third of the way and now need to descend and climb higher and higher than ever before. I remember that whole entire section being a very, very difficult one for me. I was pushed to my limit. It was incredibly hot. My feet hurt so, so, so bad. The terrain was really uneven and the section was a lot longer than we ever dreamed it was. So my expectations of having a nice short caving section and a run back to the beach became this six hour night marathon on really, really bad feet with a team right on our heels. And so there I am crying at the front of the world championships. And my teammates are running down the ridge line and now our competitors are coming down the ridge line behind us. And there's a 1200 foot drop on both sides of this ridge line. So Mikey finally realizes I'm not down there with them, starts trucking back up the ridge line and I'm bracing for impact. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, okay, Rob, um, I got a wife and a daughter and I know that you people have to do this. <laughs> then he said, but there's a difference between people that are going to win this race and people that are about to lose this race. And it's not that people that are going to win this race aren't crying, because this is hard. I don't care. Just keep crying. It's just that people that are going to win the Eco Challenge are crying. And then he grabbed my hand and said, and they're walking. <laughs> And bless his heart, he held my hand as I cried and stumbled and made my way down that ridge line the next several hours. And I realized the man is right. You know, being totally committed to something doesn't mean you don't have a crappy day, right? Being totally committed to something means that you cry while you're walking. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to my racing with the best team in the world, all of us would just carry our own gear through the race. And if someone was slower, we just complained about them until they caught up. <laughs> just like in real life. Everyone carries their own weight and People complain about them until they catch up. But the best team in the world had a different idea about how to do things. At the start line, Robert said, everybody take out all your stuff and put it in the middle. So everybody emptied out all their packs and all their gear and put it in the middle. And he looked at the course. And it started with a 75-mile run at 14,000 feet of elevation. Huge, big run. He took all of the weight from the slowest runners and gave it to the best runners. He said, the goal on this team is for everybody to suffer equally. And that's how we came up with the concept of tow lines. Because why would we wait for the slowest person if we could just take them with us? Right? In any endurance race, and you guys know your business is an endurance race, right? It's a team sport, and it's an endurance race. In any endurance race, you're going to be the strong link, and you're going to be the weak link at some point, right? If you just embrace that with your team and grab those tow lines from one another when you need them and offer a tow line when you're strong, you're going to go a heck of a lot further, faster together. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. But I'll tell you one thing we learn for sure about commitment on those crazy mountains, jungles, and rivers of the world. By definition, commitment starts when the fun stops. 
I mean, right? I mean, you don't get to find out how committed you are to something until it starts sucking, really. I mean, right? So this... Life away from the training and the competition can be just as intense for Robin. You see, this is her real job as a firefighter. We can be called to anything at any time, and we have to be ready for that, and that's what I love about being a firefighter. But it's nice to know that as an athlete and as someone who is strong and has a good endurance background, that if the you-know-what does hit the fan, that <laughs> I'm going to be able to carry that ladder you know, to the window. I'm going to be able to carry a person out of there, and that's a good feeling. Are you ultimately ruled by the hope of success or the fear of failure? Now, I learned this lesson the hard way from a good friend of mine. The first time I raced with the best team in the world, and I had been fear of failure person my whole life. So as we're going down the river, I would paddle, 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 turn around, paddle, 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 turn around. I did this for hours, seeing where our competitors were. And the next time I turned around, he grabbed the top of my head, which was facing backwards, and he physically spun my head back around to face forwards. And he leaned over, and in my ear, he said, winning is that way. But there was a guy on the other side of the boat, a guy named Steve Gurney, who heard Ian say, winning is that way. And in the next transition, they took away our two whitewater rafts and handed each of our two teams two inflatable canoes. So our competitors, Intersport, they jumped in their inflatable canoes, they took their canoe paddles, and they were gone down the river. And Steve turned to all of us. And he said, hey guys, hold up, I got an idea. I want to actually get our climbing rope out of our gearbox, and I want to tie these two boats together. This had never been done before. He wanted to tie them end to end through all the D-rings using our climbing rope, making one big, long canoe. And then he said, and why are we stuck using canoe paddles just because the race director handed them to us? We're a hell of a lot stronger kayaking team. And we actually have our kayak paddles in this box. But no one had ever thought to use kayak paddles in a canoe before. And between those two things, tying the boats together and switching out the paddles, we created what we ended up calling the Steve Gurney Missile. <laughs> and we put that sucker on the water 40 minutes behind our competitors. And it was a huge risk, and I was completely freaking out. But sometimes with huge risk comes... Absolutely. And believe it or not, they actually caught the Steve Gurney Missile on tape. I'll let you see what happened. Solomon Presidio charges forward, determined to catch the leaders before the transition to the sea kayaks. They will soon become the first American team ever to win an international adventure race. Yay! So awesome. So the big question is, what is your Steve Gurney missile going to be? I mean, how are you going to take your core strengths and talents and competencies and passion and your creativity and your incredible resources and your teammates and maybe find a way to not just, you know, tilt the game board in your favor, but maybe you're going to find a way to just completely change the game. All right, great leaders are also people that embrace their setbacks and challenges when they do happen as a chance to maybe learn something or excel in a different way. Now, I had a decent setback myself uh, about six years ago. I discovered I had stage four osteoarthritis in both my hips. And so over the last six years, I've actually had four hip replacements. The neatest thing that these crazy metal hips led me to um, was the best thing I've ever done in my life. And last year, we were so thrilled and honored to become one of the 2014 CNN heroes. And they made this little video for us. Athena! I started an organization that helps survivors of medical or traumatic setbacks live an adventurous dream as part of their recovery. You're a strong kid, Alley girl. Athena girls! Yeah, baby! Being an Athena, you're not just a survivor, you're an adventurer. We give them a different label to put on themselves, and it's something they become on their way to the finish line. During the adventures, there's a lot of moments where you're questioning whether you can keep going, and I see that in our Athena's faces. Inside, I'm saying, just wait. When you take that next step that you didn't think you could take, and then it's 100 steps you didn't think you could take, and when you're so far over that line of what you ever understood you were capable of, all of a sudden, they realize, I can do anything. And that's when I just, watch the group, and I just get proclaimed. Like, to watch them really see themselves, like, and how amazing they are. That's when I'm like, my work here is done.
<laughs> really, the crux of this whole team building piece is all about we thinking versus me thinking. There's a world full of teammates for me out here in the world. Not a world full of people I have to get over, around, and through to accomplish my goals before the end of the day. This shot right here looks like a team looking at a map. This is actually my top two navigators and the top two navigators from our biggest competitors in this race. By the third day, we had a 12-hour lead on third through 60th place because we got together with the other strongest, smartest, fastest, most capable, most successful people in the race, collaborated, and went exponentially faster for having worked together. This game is called reverse arm wrestling. And here's how it's played. When I say one, two, three, go, you guys get into your official arm wrestling position on a leg, on a chair, whatever. And when I say one, two, three, go, and this is the most important part, your goal and your teammate's goal is not to do the standard arm wrestling where you push the other guy's arm down. Your goal and your teammate's goal is to get your own arm down to the table, chair, leg, whatever it is. Get your own arm down as many times as you can in 30 seconds. On your mark, get set, go! All right, stop, give yourselves a hand. <laughs> All right, just out of curiosity, how many people got their own arm down five times or less? Five times or less, raise your hand. Ain't no shame in it. Five times or less. How many people got their own arm down more than 25 times in the 30 seconds? And I especially love doing this right after we talk about this taking everyone to the top of the podium with you and seeing a world full of teammates. And then I say, one, two, three, go, and half the room is like, oh. <laughs> You're about to blow an artery, <laughs> trying not to let your own teammate get their own arm down to the table. <laughs> it's so great, though, because it just shows us, and even the people that went back and forth right away, you probably got to admit that just for a second, you had to turn off that little inner competitor, didn't you? You had to find that little switch and go, I got this game. But we're so wired to compete, which is a great thing. It's a fantastic, I'm the biggest competitor going. We're so wired to compete, and it's great, but every day you get to decide who you're competing with. Every single day you get to make that decision as a leader. Who really is my competition and who really should be, why, why shouldn't this person be on my team? And we're also wired to see winning as being something mutually exclusive. In other words, for you to win, it entails everybody else losing. But the best leaders say, you know what, for me to win, I'm gonna get there better, stronger, faster if I take all these great people with me. All right, so last clip the Japanese team in the Eco Challenge. On day five of this race, they realized the woman on their team had ripped her Achilles tendon. And they decided to see a challenge instead of a roadblock. And they literally had to use every single one of these eight essential elements of human synergy to get to this finish line. The most incredible thing I've ever seen in the sport. All right, you aren't gonna believe this. Team Eastwind taking turns carrying their female teammate up Bartle Frere. No lie, over. been carrying her on their back for about six hours. She got off and with her uh, walking stick was able to walk part way and they put her back on their back when they got to a steep, uh, another steep area over. So I think this was a test for us to never give up, even under the toughest of odds. Most people couldn't even walk over Mount Bartle Freya. For them to carry that woman over that entire mountain, it's incredible. So cool that those guys left their egos at the start line and they made her the hero at the finish line. I actually called my guys after that aired and I said, you guys are so glad that wasn't me. <laughs> but the fact that they have her on their shoulders is such a great statement about leadership. You know, that you don't achieve a greater height when you stand on somebody else's back. You achieve a greater height when you put your teammates on your shoulders. And you don't inspire the people around you by getting out in front of them and showing them how amazing you are. You inspire your teammates by putting them on your shoulders and showing them how amazing and talented and useful and worthy they are. May you always have such huge, hairy, audacious goals you can't accomplish them alone. And may you be the kind of courageous and lucky leader who helps their people manage those challenges and changes and grab those toe lines from each other every step of the way. You guys ready to race? <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, go!
music. She's amazing. Amazing. Yeah.